Hello. Uh, first of all, I would encourage those of you who are farther back to come forward because I'm going to be showing code and it will be a lot easier to read. I did increase the font a little bit, but uh, not necessarily enough to, to make a, a great difference. So uh, welcome to creating impossible reports using a custom Apex data connector. I, I want to thank London's Calling for uh, making it possible for me to do this talk because as you'll see, I spent an absolutely ridiculous amount of time figuring this stuff out for no reason at all. Um, there are sessions that you are seeing here that hopefully you saw here at London's Calling that will change your career, that are awe-inspiring, that are amazing, that will absolutely change absolutely change the way you work. Uh, this one probably won't. Um, this is, this is, you know, my thing is, is Apex, my thing is code, a um, little bit of a geek, and I'm going to take you on this journey that, that I went on. Uh, those of you who are in the session I did with Don this morning know that uh, I really believe in the importance of learning strategically and learning things you need to learn when you need to learn them. But sometimes, and I try to live by that, but sometimes I screw up. And on this one, I really screwed up. Because one day, I read this blog post about an Apex data connector. Uh, and my reaction was, what's an Apex data connector? Now, I knew about external objects. Any of you ever do, like, trailhead badge? You know what external objects are? Yeah, we know what external objects are. And uh, I knew what external objects are, but what is an Apex data connector? So, um, oops, wrong way. So, quick background for the one or two who didn't raise your hand. An external object is a way that you can basically take an object that exists in an external system and make it look like an object on Salesforce. And this is done through uh, usually a standard uh, protocol such as OData. So, you create a new object and you connect to the, to the remote org and you can then import these objects, so to speak. Uh, an Apex data connector is, instead of using a standard protocol like OData, you use Apex. And what happens is, when you uh, ask for the schema of an object or when you query an object, uh, it goes to Apex. The Salesforce calls your Apex code and says, uh, what is the object? And get me some records. And your Apex code would do a call out to the remote system. So as I'm reading this blog post, I think, hey, you know, um, could I do this? Could I, instead of connecting to an external system, just perform a SOCL query on my lo local Apex org? And I said, why do that? Well, the reason that might be cool is because uh, I can use SOCL and I can query all kinds of objects that don't, repeer, don't, don't appear in the report builder, right? It's like I could build a report on Apex classes. Now, I know some of you are saying, why would you want to do that? I'm a coder. I want to do that. That would be cool. So is this thing possible? So I'm, I'm going down the rabbit hole a little bit further, and I say, and I look at the docs, and sure enough, it is possible. Not only is it possible, but there is an example in the Apex reference guide, that 3,000-page monstrosity, that shows how to do it. And it looks something like this. Now, this is the exact code from the, uh, the loopback connector, and I'm not gonna walk through all of it, but I'm gonna show a few cool highlights to give you an idea of, of what's going on. Okay, why did that not do that? Uh, okay, I know what I can do, I think. I can get out of PowerPoint. There we are, okay. Um, the subtleties of PowerPoint. Okay, the, um, the Apex data connector, the loopback connector, and again, this is code right out of the programming reference, uh, has two files. There's the data source provider, and the data source provider is basically what tells Salesforce, I am a Apex data connector, I'm a source. Uh, and you know, you have this method gate capability, so in this case, I'm saying I can uh, I can row query, I can do SQL queries, I can query rows, uh, and search as well, so if you want to do that. Uh, and then you have this other method called getConnection, which basically creates an instance of the other class that does all the work. Now, key things in this class. A uh, couple constructors, not terribly important, except if they're not there, things don't work. 
Um, there is a method called sync. And what sync does is it's the uh, basically lets Salesforce ask your connector, well, what are your tables and what are their columns? So it does the sync between your Salesforce object, ex external object, and the remote system, in this case, the Salesforce system. So you can see here we create a table, we create some columns, and in this example, they are just going to basically create an external object that represents an account with uh, the name of the account and the number of employees. Totally artificial and useless. Uh, going down a little bit further, uh, there's a query method. The query method has two parts, one that do, uh, does a count aggregate query, uh, and the other that executes a SQL query. Now, Salesforce is not kind enough to give your Apex Data Connector actual SQL code, right? Uh, because that's a non-standard thing. So instead, it gives you this context variable, and the context variable basically is Salesforce telling your connector, here's what I want. I want the following table, uh, I want the following filter conditions, the where clause, here are the fields, the columns that I want, are, are there any limits, order by. In other words, when you do a SQL query against an external object, Salesforce translates that SQL query into this data structure, and then you and your connector have the privilege of converting it back to SQL if you're doing a loopback connector. So most of the code in here does that, or at least sort of a primitive form of that. Um, we have search, we have executing the query. You can see we're, we're gonna be storing the name, the number of employees, uh, the external ID. We have a database query. The query itself is generated uh, down here. Here's a count query. Here's uh, sort of the heart of it. Select ID, name, number of employees from account. And the filtering is some really sort of weird code where all of these data source filter concepts that are in your context are translated back into SQL operators. So we're basically taking this context data structure with this internal objects like filter and so on and translating back into a SQL query which we can execute to give the rows back to Salesforce to make the external object work. So that's basic loopback connector. So that's where I was started, uh, where I started. And then I said, okay, what can I actually do that would be interesting? And uh, I'm not gonna go to the slide because that seems to uh, be a little problematic. Uh, instead, let me show you the four that I created. Um, and these are four reports that, at least at the time I was working on this, you couldn't do natively using the report builder. Uh, I want a report of group member assignment across all of my public groups, private ones too maybe. Uh, I, want, uh, I want to be able to report on Apex classes. I want to be able to report on profiles. Uh, and I want to report on permission set assignment. Uh, so here's an example, uh, here are the reports. So here's an example of group members. I created a group, a public group called Impossible Group, and lo and behold, I can see the users that are assigned to it on the uh, permission set. Here are the permission sets in my org. The ones you see at the beginning are sort of the built-in permission sets and the various entities that are assigned to it. Uh, and then I have my own permission set called Impossible Set that I created that uh, has my user assigned to it. User, user, you can tell I'm using a scratch org. Uh, here's my Apex one. So you see the name of the class, the API version of the class, if there's a namespace prefix, the size, and last modified by. Uh, now, from my perspective, this is sort of getting interesting. Interesting, because if I have a big org and a lot of things going on, and I want to do a report, say, okay, show me a list of all the classes that were modified in the past week, and who did it. I can do that now, and I think that's pretty cool. Um, finally, uh, an impossible profiles, where you say, okay, which profiles uh, are modify all data? Or you can do a filter, say, show me which profiles are API enabled. It's standard Salesforce reporting, so I can do filters, I can do grouping, I can do all these things. Uh, I was showing this to uh, Don Robbins earlier, and he said, well, uh, could you uh, actually do a, uh, an external object that is user profile assignment that lets you do things like, show me all of the users that have modify all data permission? They say, yeah, we can actually do that. So you can see that there's potentially some really cool 
value in being able to do reporting on objects that Salesforce does not normally let you do reporting on. So let me show you what I did with the code. And we're not gonna go into detail here. I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna get, Yes. May I have your attention, please? The public address and fire alarm systems are about to be tested. The fire alert signal will first sound, followed by the fire evacuation signal. Please take no further action. For those of you who are on the live streaming, this is a test. It is only a test. I don't know if this is designed to get you to evacuate or just put you to sleep, because this is very melodious. Did they just say that if I did not hear that, I'm supposed to notify reception? <laughs> okay, uh, moving right along. Let me show you, uh, uh, again, all the code's gonna be available, but I'm gonna show you sort of some highlights of what I changed and what you'll be seeing when you actually look at the code. Um, and that would be here. So let me scroll up to the top. Okay, the first thing you'll see is in the sync area, uh, there are more than one table. There are a whole bunch of tables. Uh, there's uh, my profile permissions table. Profiles permission table, you'll notice I don't actually have columns for all of those different permissions. Uh, that's because I generate them dynamically. I'll show you in a moment how that's done. So we've got all of our tables here. I'll show you also something called set up column labels in a moment, something else that I'm doing. The query itself looks very similar. The big difference is that what you're gonna see when you look at the code is a little more sophisticated. It actually checks what table, because it supports multiple tables instead of just one. And uh, it also has uh, things like order by limits uh, and other, other capabilities. So it's a little more sophisticated implementation. Here's get pro profile permissions. I'm basically using describe information, looking at all the profile fields uh, to get the various permission fields. So that's really cool because it's dynamic. If they add new permissions, you can always resync the, re the object and get the new ones. Uh, the SQL query is very similar. I support offset and limit. Now, let me stress, this code is totally experimental. I think I support offset and limit. I have no idea if it actually works. But it should, uh, you know, at least it's, it points you in the right direction. Now, here's another subtle thing. You, you might have noticed I'm querying uh, the group membership object, but in the report you actually saw the group name. And in the group membership object, there's only an ID, a, a lookup to the group name. The group name does not appear in that object itself. So what I'm actually doing is a related query I'm querying the related object field. So, uh, for example, when you look for the name in the permission set assignment, in my magic external object, it's actually returning permission set.name. So it's actually going and doing the related query. Uh, and that's really cool, I think, because it means that when we're turning our internal object and going to and turning it into an external object, we're not limited to just that object. We can do related field queries. We can basically promote any field we want, any related field we want, up into a first level field on the external object. So that's what the column definitions do here. Let's see, uh, getting column values is the same kind of thing. Uh, instead of returning just the name, we'll return group.name. Instead of returning type, we do group.type. So we're able to do the related query. Moving further, the uh, where term parser in the sample code is somewhat more sophisticated. You won't see a million if statements. It's table driven, uh, a little bit recursive to handle subquery. So it, I think it's pretty cool. And that part seems to work okay. Uh, then again, it's experimental code. And set up column labels that I referred to earlier uh, is what allows the following. If I look at the external object for the profile, you can see that I have the API name, 
And I also have the label for that field. So what I'm doing there is I'm basically pulling in, uh, using described information to pull in the label and the description and if it's sortable and, and things like that. And ultimately making it a somewhat more robust solution uh, that is extendable to add additional objects, which is uh, important because you don't want to create multiple data sources. You want one data source to support all of your loopback objects uh, if you decide to take this route. All right, let me go back to slides now. So anyway, we did this. Okay, some rules for the road. Things have gotten a lot better. This works a lot better than it did when I started playing with this and wasting time with it six months ago. Uh, some of the tricks that uh, I needed to do, which I, I'm not sure you need to do all of these, but I'm gonna give them to, to you anyway. Uh, when you update the connector object, the connector class, especially, especially if you're changing anything to do with the schema, you have to modify the provider class too. You don't have to like change anything significant, just out of space and resave it. For some reason, if you don't push both of them during the meditated deploy or, or the source push, it doesn't work. So you have to update both of them. It is important to cast objects to the correct type. So for example, if I define a column in my column definition that's text, and I query the object and it's an ID, the fact that an ID automatically converts to a text does not necessarily mean it's going to work. So you have to cast every object uh, that you retrieve from a, a record into the type that is expected. Do not assume that any sort of automatic conversion will work. Uh, the external ID field is required and is special. Uh, if anything goes wrong in your Apex data connector, things will not work it will raise an error message and the error message is absolutely useless, so pay no attention to it. Uh, you will have to go and capture debug logs and, and sort of guess and experiment because uh, there's just, you know, whatever is confusing the external object mechanism and the, the, the Salesforce Connect mechanism, the report builder mechanism, it, the, the reports that result are completely irrelevant, useless, don't even waste your time figuring it out. If you do this and you add a field or you add a, 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 an object, an external object, and you do not see the fields in the report builder, try the classic report builder. Uh, it should work in the classic report builder and then it will work in the lightning report builder. I don't know, it just seems to be that way right now. Uh, remember security. This Apex can see everything which means that this is a absolutely brilliant way to bypass all of your system security when it comes to review, uh, uh, looking at records. So if you're actually planning to do this, think about security. It is really important. This example code doesn't do it at all. I don't, I don't even address it. Now, for those of you who are thinking, wow, this looks cool, I, I might want to use that, there, there is a catch. And the catch is Salesforce Connect isn't free. So if you want to create a data source to do any of this stuff, uh, it's $4,000 a month. Um, so that's why I sort of said at the beginning this might be the most useless session uh, in London's Kong. However, I was talking earlier to, to Don who is devious and he came up with a very interesting idea. Um, could we not uh, build the connector on a DE org and instead of doing a SQL call on the local system, do a REST call onto a production system. And then you have your DE org, which basically can create reports on external objects from a production system and do all this stuff. And uh, I don't know, maybe you can. <laughs> I don't know if Salesforce would want us to do this. That seems like it's, it's bypassing all kinds of uh, license restrictions maybe, but I think it would work, so uh, it's, worth, it's worth considering. So uh, the sample code uh, that you can take a picture of the QR code, uh, it's on GitHub, I put it up there this morning. I must stress, this code is crap. Uh, it is experimental, it's not production ready, there's no error handling, it's just pure uh, 
for those of you who are into geeking out on some interesting aspects of the platform that may or may not be useful to you, uh, feel free to, to explore this and uh, uh, that's it. I'm glad, I'm glad the, the, the rabbit hole I went down uh, hopefully provided some value to you and certainly uh, thanks again to London's Calling for letting me make use of all of that effort. Uh, we have, I think, like a minute for any questions. Yes. I think it's a wonderful idea that Salesforce should, you know, but I don't know if Salesforce really would want anybody to do this. Uh, if they did, you'd think they would have provided the reports as administrative report capability in the first place because it's not that hard to do. So I don't know what, I mean, for all I know, I'm gonna get you know, an, an angry call from Andy Fawcett tomorrow and say, Dan, what were you talking about at London's Calling? Nobody's supposed to do this. I don't know. Uh, I think that's our time. I'll be around. Uh, thank you. I hope you found this uh, entertaining, and uh, I hope your own rabbit holes lead you down interesting ways so that you can present them at future London's callings. And, uh, and that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>